Afternoon. <laughs> um, so it's my place. If, if you don't know who I am, I'm Wendy Hall, and um, uh, I'm, it's my pleasure to be here this afternoon and to uh, chair this wrap-up panel. I'm just trying. I'm wearing this so that we can send the microphone rounds so when we start trying to get questions for the audience. It's a beautiful day, and it's been a long day, so we're not going to run for two hours. We're going to try and run for about an hour. So those doing the closing session, we would plan to be doing that by an hour from now, so about quarter past five. So everyone gets a chance to do more networking and get out into the sunshine. Um, so I am not going to... We have a wonderful panel, and the, the point of this afternoon's panel is to, as I said when I asked Gertie the question, is to think about careers. How have we done it? People sitting on the panel, the people that you heard talk today. You know, it's when you come to these, I remember as a young PhD student myself, going and hearing people 40 years older than me talking about what they'd done and what they do, and you think, how did they do it? Um, I remember very much being a young student PhD student, well, a young lecturer in computer science and thinking that this was all just too hard to do because the world just seemed to be against me. I can talk a bit about that later, it was chair's privilege maybe, but um, I, we have four wonderful ladies here who are going to tell you their stories. I'm not going to try and introduce them, read out a CV, they're going to introduce themselves, we'll just go in the order from my right to my left and uh, let them tell you what's helped them get to where they are today what are their top tips and what are their top tips about what not to do yeah well that's well you can say what you like but that's that's how I that's how I'm framing it um, so I'm gonna start with Becky from Bloomberg it's a bit of alliterative there <laughs> Becky from Bloomberg everybody Hi, I'm Becky from Bloomberg. You, <laughs> you might have gotten a card with my face on it. <laughs> anyway, so I'll tell you a little bit about how I got on the card, maybe. <laughs> uh, it's not that special of a story. Anyway, um, so I have been working with Bloomberg since 2006. Um, I interned with Google before that. I've been now with Bloomberg for 10 years. Um, it seems kind of crazy when I say that out loud. I know I don't look it. Right? OK, cool. <laughs> Live audience. <laughs> you don't look it. You don't look it. I like to check if you're alive. Oh, wait. Um, all right. So, gosh, it feels like ages ago. So, I now live in London. Um, I moved over from New York uh, early last year. My accent might sound a little funny for a Brit. Um, that's because I'm not. Um, and yeah, I'm just loving being in Europe. So, what has made me stay with Bloomberg for 10 years? Um, we have a very fast-paced and dynamic environment. There's really no other way to say it. Um, the challenges are just never ending, and it's been awesome. I've worked in three different teams, um, all doing very different things, some of them with client-facing applications. I think I spoke to many of you yesterday, maybe showed you some of the terminal apps, the actual Bloomberg terminal software that we work on. Um, we deal with a lot of data. The number, the public number, I guess, is 35 billion ticks a day. Anyway, um, so it's very dynamic and we do a lot of different things to meet the market with whatever is going on. Um, like I showed some of you our Brexit function, which is a keen topic these days. Um, so thinking, like rewinding the clock and thinking back to what made an impact for me. Um, I was studying in New York, I was studying at Columbia, and I think one of the biggest things that helped me out is I, I, I gained the um, relationship with a professor of working on a project related to embedded processors. And I think that really kind of skyrocketed it for me because before that, I sort of showed up at Columbia like, hey, I want to get a master's, whatever. I'm going to do some, some coursework and maybe submit a paper or something. And really, that relationship with a professor, Professor Edwards, if anybody wants to Google him, um, he, he really said, hey, you can do a little bit more than just do your coursework. So I did that had no idea that that was going to happen. Um, he sort of said, hey, PhD is an option for you. And I was like, well, I don't know. I don't know if that's really for me. Maybe I'll try working for a couple of years. And bam, here I am 10 years later talking to you about Bloomberg. Um, so obviously, I really like what I've been doing. Um, I guess advice on what to do and what not to do. Have somebody review your CV. 
like a professor, somebody in the industry, that's been something that's really been useful for me. Don't just send it to your friends. Yes, do that because they can help you with a lot of things, but really send it to somebody that's going to be looking at it from a different lens, um, somebody close to you. Um, I'd say don't ask advice from a professional that you don't know. You can certainly ask me. I'm here to help you. Probably everybody <laughs> here is here to help you. Um, you know, I'm part of the Women Encourage Conference, so obviously I'm going to encourage you. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't send it to like a random, kind of a random um, contact in the industry that you don't know. That's, that's maybe one piece of advice. And the other piece of advice that I would give you is if you're going to be doing technical interviews, really get involved in some hackathons. Um, and maybe if hackathons aren't really your thing because they're sort of waning in the interest right now, but do some coding challenges. Like I know we, we have one that we run um, and it's so exciting because that's really what you're kind of going to be doing in there. You're going to have to think on your feet, think quick. Um, you only have a certain amount of time to solve the problem and you need to solve it correctly. And the, the coding, I mean, different interviewers have obviously different styles that they go with, but um, there's, it's going to give you a yes or no answer, I guess, is the thing. It's not going to be really looking at your code style and that kind of thing. It wants to know correctness. Did you actually solve the problem? So I guess those are my two pieces of advice. Wow. Well, there's only three minutes, so I'm going to ask you some supplementaries. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but where next? Where next um, in my career? Mm. Oh, gosh. Um, I guess I am a team leader now. And one of the things that's really been in my mind, I've been a team leader now for maybe five years. And one of the things that's really been in my mind is I'm, I'm doing a lot of like email stuff um, these days. I'm sorry, I'm giving you my full, please don't tell my boss. <laughs> <laughs> it's on camera. Oh, awkward. <laughs> sorry, Tom and Tom and Mike and Peter. Um, all men, all men. Your bosses are oh. all men. Right now, I think actually yes, but I have worked for several women. So right now, yes. Just wondered, just wondered. A little bit sad. We do have several women. Okay. In, in Sorry, I interrupted you. So yes, where next? Yes, yes. Oh, yes. so where next? So you were talking about email when you when you said to the camera <laughs> something about email. I do a lot with emails right now, and actually Excel, as was um, stated earlier in one of the presentations, um, and. You know, I'd really like to get back to doing something that's a little bit more, I don't know, exploratory with programming. We have a lot of challenges to solve, and we're actually getting a lot more involved with open source than we had previously. Um, Bloomberg's about 30 years old, and so a lot of what the Bloomberg system has been constructed with, there wasn't really open source at the time to do that thing, and now mm -hmm. the industry has evolved, and so we're doing a lot more to get involved with open source, and I think that'd be kind of amazing to do, because I love my company, I love my job, so it'd be kind of great to have both worlds. Can you imagine working anywhere other than Bloomberg? Don't listen, bosses. <laughs> um, I've definitely thought about it. I mean, not-for-profit has really been kind of in my heart forever. I work a lot with Habitat for Humanity in my like vacation time and whatnot. And so that's really been kind of in the back of my mind, is like doing something more for the greater good. Some companies let you off, let you give you time to do that sort of thing. Yeah, and we, we do a lot. We have um, Bloomberg philanthropies. Oh. Sorry. Awesome. That's my five minutes. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Perfect. Right. Well, that was five minutes. I didn't know I was actually going to make a noise when the timer finished. So we'll see how this goes. I'll keep that going, okay? So you're going to get the five-minute timer. Um, and now it's Pearl from EPFL. I'm trying to think of the right alliterative thing. It's, you're in there. Are you the P in EPFL? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm a double P, actually. <laughs> oh, poo. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. Okay, so. It's a bit of so a buzz. My, my name is Pearl Pu. I, Bring it closer um, to you. I was born and raised in China. Uh, did all my um, uh, undergrad and graduate uh, education in the United States. And it's been 23 years I'm with um, EPFL. I moved to several continents. Um, I teach um, user experience design, AI, um, and HCI in general. Um, most um, know for the work that I did in user modeling, because I really am interested in uh, user behavior. Um, and I devised uh, some uh, model and language to um, capture and understand uh, user preferences, and that lead to uh, work in recommender systems. Um, so, uh, 
the tips. Um, I think um, we need to be curious about science. That's my first tip. Um, and um, also, in the uh, um, in the studies that I did, uh, especially in mathematics and computer science, I realized uh, curiosity also led me to uh, to to actually demand the professor to teach the way that I wanted to understand a subject area. I mean, Switzerland is actually an interesting country. I observe a lot of the young women uh, in high schools. They have been told that girls are not good in mathematics. But if I look at um, the way they are taught, it's just not appropriate for them. Uh, so curiosity is actually a very strong emotion. So. Um, if we are curious, if we insist on learning something, um, we will eventually acquire the skills. Um, otherwise, I think um, uh, willpower is really important. Uh, in fact, some of those tips I give you, uh, it takes a lot of time for me to uh, develop those skills. I uh, was um, a girl who didn't have a lot of uh, perseverance and, and uh, endurance, even in the, in the sports that I practice. Uh, so willpower really helped me to uh, insist and, and do things until I, I you know, can have uh, meaningful results. Uh, other tips are, I think you know, the people you meet are really important. If I look at my career, in graduate school, in the early development, uh, career development, is always the people that I meet uh, that are very important. They, they help me uh, understand and, and develop uh, those skills. Uh, but unfortunately, people are also uh, are the prohibitors sometimes in your career. Uh, again, living in Europe uh, taught me uh, they, they can say a lot of um, uh, strange things to you in Switzerland, especially about girls or women in, in professional positions. So you have to learn to distinguish who are the persons um, they, will, they will help you and promoters of your career and avoid those um, uh, that can hurt, hurt the development, which is the, the third thing that I wanted uh, to talk about, that is um, personal health. It's, it sounds very strange, but in order to really um, be in a career that's very demanding, you have to have a very good uh, personal health. Not just absence of diseases, but um, uh, you know, mental health, uh, how, and to know your own um, mood as well as your abilities and strengths and weaknesses. And personally, since I practice meditation and yoga, I have uh, been much stronger uh, dealing with people around me, stress around me, um, because during, during the 20-some years I was in Switzerland, I also uh, raised three, uh, three boys. Uh, besides the teaching career, besides also supporting my husband in his career. So all of this uh, meant you need to have a, a very strong personal health. That um, actually, maybe I look uh, okay, but there are lots of, lots of uh, diseases we're battling. Um, but meditation definitely uh, helps us through these um, crises. Wow. You've got 20 seconds, so that's brilliant, Pearl. That's, that's really interesting. I, I, I'm going to ask you, although the time is about to go, um, how do you feel? The time is literally about to go. So how do you f feel about a, um, how your career has developed, the balance between having the family and wanting to progress in your career? Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you just say a little bit about that? Because it's really yeah. important for a lot of women. Well, first of all, having children is really a personal choice. But once you decide, uh, you just have to commit to that decision, which demands a lot of uh, physical strength as well as mental strength. 
Um, and in the beginning of uh, my years in Switzerland, I constantly asked myself, uh, to, you know, do I want to be in, at home or do I want to pursue my career? And, and I, I was in a, in, a, in a meeting very much like this one. Um, I met a woman who told me that if you decide and you commit and you have children and you have career, um, it's like um, a maman perdu, but papa gagné, which means uh, you lose a little bit, you know, for the children of their mom's time, but the, the father is much more involved. And that has been my experience. I found this to be very rewarding because today uh, my husband is very engaged in raising our three children. And when we celebrate Mother's Day, I insist on having him also sharing the, the cakes and the gifts our kids give to me. Uh, but networking is definitely helps me uh, look at um, things different in different light because I was asking the wrong question, staying oh. home and it's not an or, you can have both. In fact, uh, the adverse things, uh, like I said before, people that I met, um, they would say, you trying to have everything? Um, this was 20 years ago in Switzerland. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Pearl. Thank you for that. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to that in the questions. Um, so now we go to Tony from Edinburgh. Um, uh, and yeah, Tony from Edinburgh and HBC Women is how I think of yeah. you. Yeah, so uh, your five minutes, Tony, starts now. Okay, so yeah, I am Tony Collis from the University of Edinburgh. Um, I've actually been one of those people that you, you're often advised not to be. I have done <laughs> three degrees at Edinburgh and now I work there. Um, and I was told you can't, you can't possibly do that. So number one, don't listen to all the advice you get. Take it or leave it. Listen, take it on board if it fits you. If it doesn't, walk away. So yeah, just to give you a bit more about me, I am an applications consultant um, working at the University of Edinburgh. I'm part of the team that runs the National High Performance Computing Service for the UK, which is a great privilege. I wake up every morning knowing I'm going to get paid to pay on the fastest machine in the UK, and I get to pay, play with some of the fastest machines in the world yet to get onto the fastest one, which is in China, <laughs> but I'm working on it. Um, and I get paid to do that. What, what more could you want? So that's my second piece of advice. Choose a career that you love. There will be days when you do not want to get out of bed, however much you love your career. If you don't like what you're doing, move on, because you will have hard days whatever you do. Choose something you go, you know what? I'm doing something that matters here. I want to be here. I can get through this terrible day when everybody's having a go at me, my life's falling apart because it will happen at some point. Something will go wrong and you'll think it's the end of the world and it won't be. But at the time, especially during a PhD, by the way, for those of you doing a PhD, it will end. I never thought mine would, but I got there eventually. And it is. Yeah, that last <laughs> push is hard. It is. It's a hard push, but that's why you're valuable at the end of it because you have the graph to finish. So first of all, take advice. But you don't have to follow that advice. It's advice, it's opinions, it's somebody else's experience. Take as much advice as you can get, weigh it all up and choose the route that's good for you. If I was told anything that really stuck to me when I was younger, it was grab every opportunity that's thrown at you. You can always let go five minutes later. If you see it whizzing by and you don't hold on, you don't know what you've missed. So hold on to those opportunities, and that also means the advice that comes in, take it, absorb it, and decide whether or not you're going to follow it, or maybe just take the little nugget that applies to you. So I just want to also give you a few other bits and pieces that I've learned from setting up women in high performance computing that I think are more relevant to a broader audience. So for example, I'm a physicist. I'm now sat in a room, presumably the majority of you are computer scientists. I'm totally out of my depth right now. Interdisciplinary work is the future. There is no such thing as a physicist, a chemist, a computer scientist anymore. They do not exist. You will see that even in a computer science degree, you're doing modules and courses that aren't traditional computer science. That means if something sparks your interest, that makes you go, you know what, I want to do that for the rest of my life, follow it. It doesn't matter if it doesn't fit in this box. You don't have to conform 
to what you see people who are older than you have done. Because you know what? They did different things when they were younger. Everybody who's coming through the system now will do something very different from what I've done. And I only really finished my PhD six years ago. Don't worry if you don't want to be the perfect person. A lot of people told me when I was younger, oh, you need to be more assertive. Oh, you need to, you need to learn how to speak in public. You need to do this, that, and the other. And I realized after quite some time that they wanted be, me to be more like my male colleagues. On average, big generalizations going on. Um, but one of the reasons why I'm valuable, I found out, to my department is because I do things differently. I like to be a little bit of a risk taker. I like to make people do things differently. I like to challenge people. And one of the reasons I do that is because I don't do things the way the majority of my male colleagues do. So you don't have to conform. If you don't want to go and be super assertive, because that's what everybody in your group does, you don't have to. If you are, then great, grab it. But you don't have to conform. The other thing that really opened my eyes was the day that I realized there is something called imposter syndrome. Who's heard of imposter syndrome? Oh, that's good. That's really good. When I found out about it, most of the people I work with had no idea. Most of you, at some point in your career, will experience imposter syndrome. This is where you're sat at the front going, I'm a fraud. They're all going to figure this out. I'm only here because I've conned everybody. They're all going to know, and I'm going to lose my job, and it's going to be a disaster. I still feel like this all the time. I feel like a fraud right now in front of you guys. The compensation is I know that most of us feel like that at some point. The only person who doesn't feel like that oddly is my husband, and I just don't understand why not. <laughs> Thankfully, I also trust his opinion, which brings me to another point. Have an advocate. Oh, I totally talk too long. You can have, you can finish that I point. will finish the advocate point. Have an advocate. Have somebody that you trust who tells you, you know what, you should go for that. You should do that or you should do that. When you get rejected from a journal article or a grant proposal or a job interview that says, you know what, you are good enough, but everybody gets rejected. But it has to be somebody you trust. Sometimes your partner or your best friend isn't the right person because you don't believe that they are going to give you an honest opinion. Sometimes they are. So that's my other piece of advice. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, I still suffer from imposter syndrome. I still think people are going to find me out and that I should never have got all the gongs and awards that I've got. It's very hard. And you said your husband doesn't. And I think this is the stereotypical thing that men do, but they play it differently. They just play it differently. Or maybe that's a bit... But I think it's, it's very different the way we play our careers and it affects the decisions that you make. Um, this is the piece about ask for advice, get people to check your CV. Right? You're not an imposter, but it's very, really very hard for us. Uh, I'm happy to take your, qu your point now. Just... Say, it, say the name again. Uh, Osa Kayan, the last year Thank at Uppsala, you. made a brilliant speech. I think it's still on the web somewhere about this topic. She really is really good. Perfect. Um, thank you very much for that, because this is a big issue yes. and it holds a lot of people back. The other thing I was going to ask you, Tony, was what really motivated you? I was really interested when I saw you set up Women in HPC. What really <laughs> motivated you to do that? Because these are hard to do, these, but they're important, the networking. Um, so... I, I'm really lucky in EPCC where I work. We are somewhere between 25 and 35% women, depending on fluctuations in staff. We're small enough that it fluctuates a lot. What shocked me was when I work on big European projects, and I was consistently the only woman in the team. Yeah. I'd go to project meetings. And I looked around, coming from physics, where there are all these groups, women in physics, women in this, that, and the other. And I looked around, and there's nothing. And thankfully, I had an incredibly supportive boss who said to me, you know what, if you want to do something about it, I'll help you. And so, yeah, we set it up. And I have to say, it's one of the other reasons I go to work, because I know I'm making just a little difference. If all I do is I get one woman to stay in HPC, I feel like it was worth all the effort. Very good. OK, we might come back to that, too, in the discussion. Um, and now uh, we go to Jane from Oracle. All right. <laughs> But well, very well, uh, so very well known, and uh, I got the wrong town she came from. But anyway, Jane, you're five minutes now. Yes. 
Good afternoon. Um, I'm not suffering from imposter syndrome here. I'm not a computer scientist. I'm somebody that works in the technology industry. And I'm focusing my advice from an employer's perspective, but also from a personal perspective. I have worked in male-dominated industries from construction to technology all my life. Uh, when I studied land economics, I was five girls out of a class of 60, and that has not changed in the long time that I have been in and out of that industry. I've been in Oracle for 15 years. I have done three different jobs uh, in that 15 years. And one of the things I learned, particularly when you're working for a large organization, is that you can create your own career. You can decide that there are jobs in that organization for you and you can work towards them. And the way to work towards them is to create your network. Your network is your job, is your career. And that is not necessarily internal in the company, but externally as well. The reason why you're all in this room is to start building a network. People that you can lean on, take advice from, and understand how they develop their own careers. So I'm going to start looking at sort of where do you start, the hiring process, the whole computer science industry, let's call it that. I'm responsible for Europe, Middle East and Africa for a program called Oracle Academy, which works with academic institutions from schools to universities globally. I have a team that are based around the world. My communication is through the internet, through webcast, through, the, through travel, but I live locally and I work globally. And that's a good thing to understand in your career in this industry. You could live anywhere in the world, but you could still be doing a global job. And therefore, there are a couple of things that you need to think about when you are going for your first steps into, not necessarily a large corporation, into a startup, any organization, is what is the job that I want to go for? What are the competencies of that role that are expected of me? Understand what these competencies are, but also attribute to yourself as a woman certain competencies that are critical regardless of the sector or the career you're in. Idea generation, problem solving, communication skills, team building, multitasking. Now, if you were to look at that list in isolation, to me that would say women. These are the kind of skills that women have. And the good news that we're looking at right now is this industry that you are joining has a huge demand for talent right now, regardless of gender. EU stats right now are anticipating that there will be 900,000 unfulfilled jobs in computer science skills from data scientists to business analysts to programmer by 2020. So what that tells me is opportunity opportunity for everybody regardless of gender because the demand is there for you right now. The other piece of advice I would say is don't fixate on working for a technology company because every company is a technology company. <laughs> there was a great quote by Terry Lee who used to be the chief executive of Tesco's a long time ago. <laughs> you may know like a Walmart type supermarket chain. And he basically said, I run a technology company that happens to sell groceries. So think of that, because I do many lectures to students who are about to graduate. And I ask the question, where do you want to work when you leave this university? And all the hands go up, and Google, Oracle, SAP, Microsoft. And I said, did anybody think about working for a not-for-profit organization like UNESCO? to understand how to map areas that are unmapped around the world? Did anybody think about working for Walmart or Tesco's or a bank? So, you know, don't confine your, your process in terms of job searching to a very narrow area. Decide what you want to do. Find the companies that have those kind of competencies and are looking for these skill sets and work towards them. And when you get into an organization, 
continue to network. I always say your job is your network, your network is your job. And in organizations like Cisco and Intel and Google, etc., and Oracle, there are women groups. Finish that point. Finish that point. Which you should become a part of because these groups include men who will also become part of your network and your mentor. So join organizations, whether professional, informal, or otherwise, because they will give you that path and that support. Thank you, Jane. Did, did I hear you say, that was wonderful by the way, did I hear you say um, join women's networks because they'll include men? Yes. It, talk, talk me through that, because uh, for all sorts of reasons, that's the big dilemma for women's networks. Yeah. So, using for example with an oracle, as an example for an uh, organization, a group called Oracle Women Leadership. So, that is designed to create networking groups among across lines of business, but it is also an all-inclusive group because we are all about diversity and we're all about making sure that we are not trying to exclude people from different parts of our business. So that group includes men, and if you are going to go into a certain line of business, you may need to have a male mentor at mm, some absolutely. point, because that may be the only mentor you have. You don't potentially always have the opportunity to have a woman mentor. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's a bad thing as well, because we talked about imposter syndrome. I'm not saying try and be a man, but observe their behavior. You know, we talk about the glass ceiling, we talk about the glass walls, you know, you maybe can't go to a game of golf because you don't play golf in the golf course. And men seem to be able to project more obviously their career ambitions, but you don't need to necessarily do that. Watch how they do it, but then have a conversation with your manager to say, I might not be the loudest in the room, but my ambition is equally strong and it you could be demonstrated by X, Y and Z. Mm -hmm. That's a very good, very good point. This is the dilemma. Now, before I open it up to the audience, does anyone here want to come back on some fun, something someone else has said? Networking. Get yourself some business cards and to hold those up. Number one thing you should have with you at all times, business cards. Yeah. Very good point. Very good point. If you're on a plane, if you're on a train, mm -hmm. you never know who you're going to meet Absolutely. and have a conversation with. I, you know, even in a bar, you know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, but do that cautiously. Uh, just uh, uh, in addition to have somebody look at your CV, I think it's also important to uh, find the right person to write rec recommendation letters, and not uh, a generic one, but develop a personalized one that emphasizes your skills and your talents in a very genuine way. Yeah. And that takes time. It's not you, you meet that person, and the next day it would be a perfect letter. Um, I spend a lot of time doing that. Do you, for people? Oh, yeah. 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 So help others as well. Yeah. Becky, anything you want to add? Right, so I want you all, you've got, got about half an hour, um, to, to, to comment, ask questions. Right, so we've got, um, I'm going to take two or three together and then come back to the panel rather than one at a time. So I'm going to say the lady in the middle, but it's all ladies today. So. <laughs> Hi. Uh, we keep hearing that there are less women in the computer science and this is something we hear and we think it's a problem. But if you think about it, at least for women in this room, it's a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. So my question is, for all the great women in this room, what advice would you give so that we grab this opportunity? What can we start doing right now so that we can make use of the fact that there are fewer people so that we can propel ourselves forward? Okay, so Bill, yeah, using the fact there are less women too. All right, hold that thought. I'm going to take another one. Come on, people. What would you like to ask about or talk about? Yeah, good. You've had an inspiring day. I'm expecting inspiring questions. Hi, um, I'm a PhD student at EPFL and um, I go to a lot of these things for women to sometimes just for the network, sometimes because there's an interesting talk, you know, whatever the reason. And it's come to the point where my male um, colleagues get extremely frustrated and to the point where every time that I go to something now they're like, oh, is this a girl thing? 
and they feel very left out, and they feel very, um, yeah, they, this, it, like it's unfair to them. Like we're getting all of this, you know, um, extra treatment and this and that, and and they're really frustrated and. I yep. don't know how to respond to that kind of stuff. That's an extremely good point. Anyone else on this sort of theme? Yes. Can you get the mic over there to N Noria? Is it Noria? Nor Noria. She's chairing next year's conference. Just in, in line of the last question, um, uh, it, it's, it's our, in our case, so I, I'm the dean of the informatics school at UPC in Barcelona, and we have a lot of uh, activities, or we try to do a lot of activities, uh, in uh, secondary schools just to engage uh, young girls uh, in studying informatics or engineering in general, but especially informatics. And uh, always there is a, a discussion, even if, with our students at the university, if we should do activities just for girls uh, in secondary school or girls and boys. So this is... <laughs> Uh, always a, a point. So, uh, and this is uh, a discussion also at the university level. So there was a, a term I didn't get. Yeah, in that. The, the, the question is, what do you think about uh, um, f making activities in activities. secondary school? Activities, so, yeah. For instance, so streaming. Yeah. You're asking about so just, streaming just for girls yeah. and, and to try to catch the attention for the informatics, or for both girls and boys, mm. with the idea of catching the attention of the, the girls. Now, I, all those three questions I've thought about a lot. I'd love to answer them all, but I'm going to throw it open to, the, to our panel first. I'm going to start with Jane, right? Just to answer, you know, okay. don't have to answer them all, just... Um, on the question of K-12 education, um, with an Oracle Academy, we do a lot of programming workshops for younger students, age eight and above. And one of the things that I've experienced and it's personal experience just observing in the classroom is that if you have girls and boys together learning the same thing together at a young enough age gender does come off the table because it's a bit like learning any language you know, you, you know you're learning together nobody's saying this is a boys thing or the girls thing because you're age eight and you're learning to program you, you're not actually segregating yourself you know mentally at any point so um, whilst we do a lot of girls only workshops um, we find that actually having both the sexes collaborate is very positive because they say young enough gender can come off the table um, and it just becomes something you do but it doesn't stick thing. the research shows it doesn't stick w when the hormones kick in when girls you know when they become teenagers all that it does it doesn't stick the girls withdraw from doing science and nature in a mixed classroom. Nature, hmm? not, we don't know if it's nature or nurture. Exactly, mm -hmm. and it's, these mm -hmm. are big issues, but the research shows that's where it all goes wrong. Mm -hmm. that, those teenage years... I would still argue is, against segregation, because if you segregate from the beginning, you're segregating. No, I'm, you this know. is different. I'm not arguing mm -hmm. segregating from the yeah. beginning, because mm -hmm. again, all the research shows in primary school, it's great. Yes. Teach everyone together. Uh, and mm -hmm. it really encourages girls to get involved in science and programming. But um, there is an argument, and some schools are testing it, that you should stream for science in the secondary school. We, but these things are hard to do experiments exactly. with, because if you get it wrong, you've mm -hmm. ruined a whole generation of kids. So it's really hard to do the experiments. Exactly. And I think the industry, inverted commas, regardless what part, has, has a lot to contribute to that in terms of making sure that they are showing the diversity of the career opportunities, showing that they are, that you have women's leadership groups within their organisations, etc. So it's kind of everybody's responsibility to do that. And I think you'll find most of the larger companies are doing that. You mm. know. But does it... I mean, you know, in the UK, I, I haven't got the figures for the whole of Europe, but in the UK, just trying to get girls to keep, stick with maths and physics to keep the doors open for a science career is really hard. Mm -hmm. they, you know, it's, so it Maybe in the UK, but what I'm finding, because I work across EMEA, 
is that places like the Middle East, it's a real <gasps> opportunity <laughs> and it's becoming something that's actually the reverse yes. of what we're seeing in the UK yes. for different reasons. For different reasons, though, for completely different reasons. Global and local. Yeah. But then every country is going to be different. Yeah, but I would argue, you, leave, I think you know, Europe, I think yeah. Europe is like this generally. Mm -hmm. I just, I think the Middle East is a very different, mm -hmm. different environment. Anyway, I should shut up. I've done a lot of research in this area. So, but um, did you want to say anything else about the others, uh, Jane? Or? Um, how to grab opportunity? I think we covered it. Make yourself visible, and be evidence based. You know, your CV should be evidence based. I think you alluded to earlier. You know, show what you've done. You know, most you know most employers expect your um, your CV to be online. They expect to be able to see projects or you know. Um, projects that you've been working on and be prepared to be flexible in terms of where you, you know, your career is going to take you because we won't, you know, as I say, you can work locally um, and globally, but be flexible where you want to go. Tony, what would you like to say in response to those points? So it, as, as I've listened to this discussion develop, it's interesting. I think all three questions actually interlink quite nicely. They do. Um, so the first one was, um, what advice can you give to, to take advantage of the opportunity that we are currently a minority, which is a really good point. I am, I set out women in HPC because I'm in a minority and it has done great things for my career. It has put me on the map. My network has exploded. <laughs> I mean, it's fantastic for me. So do something unusual with it. But more importantly, don't be afraid to take an opportunity that's designed for women, which brings us to question two. To answer both of you, how do you deal with the girl thing? Don't be afraid. There are so many barriers, many of them hidden to you being a woman in computer science and technology. Most of them you don't even know about until 20 years later. I've seen now in hindsight that during my undergraduate degree, barriers were my way and I had no idea. So if an opportunity, if a scholarship for women comes up, you know what, grab it. There is enough being put on your way, you deserve it. Um, for example, in, in the UK, there is a scholarship program for women, and it's so prestigious. If you get it, you are a top-notch woman. But some people are like, oh, you can't do that because it, it's for women only and it's negative. But you know what? If you are actually successful, the acceptance rate is so incredibly low that you are the best of the best. So grab the opportunities. Don't be ashamed. Um, in terms of dealing with people having a go at you for participating in events like this, something I deal with all the time. People turn to me, well, why do you need a woman in HPC network? You know, why, you know, why is there not a man in HPC network? And I'm like, look around you. <laughs> it's there in the workplace. Um, to some extent, some people will never get it. And that's really sad. And it's our job to walk away from here and talk about why it's important that everybody talks about the need for women in this field yeah. and all fields. It's our job to get that message out there. Some people won't want to listen to it. But coming to these events gives you the network that men automatically have by being in a male-dominated environment. Because as much as I resisted this when I was younger, it is so important that you know women. Um, I used to think I was fine with just having male friends. You know what? I need to talk to women sometimes. <laughs> my husband's great, my colleagues are great, but sometimes I just want to complain about being a woman when all the men go to the pub and I don't want to. <laughs> um, and in terms of um, whether or not we should do streaming, I struggle with this too. I'm really, really conflicted. The one thing I would say is, one of the things I've done with women in HPC is we do training just for women. Well, not just for women, because in the UK that would be illegal. But I target women. That's why you're surrounded. <laughs> yeah, you have to be very careful. Um, and uh, I generally get one or two men, but you know what? The room is so incredibly different. As the trainer, when I do these, I actually really enjoy teaching that compared to the male-dominated co dominated courses that I normally do. I, I never thought I'd say that when I start, set out to do it, but the, the, just the environment is different. So there is a place for it. I'm very conflicted. I hope in my lifetime they are no longer necessary. That, that may be an impossibility. Great. Paul? So I completely agree with uh, what has been already said. I think networking is really important. Um, in terms of uh, opportunities, uh, we heard uh, the uh, job opportunities um, and um, the decline. I think that's a great uh, way of thinking. Um, I just want to add, I think I've seen a lot of CVs coming to, coming to my, uh, my desk. Uh, women are uh, very uh, good in 
compassion, empathy. I think you need to emphasize those qualities. And also look for jobs that uh, will, um, will actually uh, make you flourish in those areas. I think design thinking is great. User experience design. Uh, the first rule is compassion, to be empathy, because you're designing things for other people. And that's actually really, really hard for a lot of people. Uh, I heard in Google, um, almost every manager uh, needs to attend a seminar on user study on, and also know something about user experience design. Uh, so look for those opportunities. As well as in data science, uh, all the, the students at EP, EPFL are very, very intelligent, but what makes the, the intelligent student also uh, great and stand out are the ones who ask meaningful questions. Mm. You know, what results can inform certain important decisions? Look, look for meaningful careers. So. Becky. All right, so I think in terms of the education question, I'm not really sure what the answer is. I don't, I don't research in this field, and I'm kind of afraid of her, actually. <laughs> but my, I guess my advice would be um, solicit mentors. Um, I work with FIRST Robotics, um, and often when I go and work with um, women and men in secondary school, they look at me and they go, you're a programmer? And I'd love for that question to stop. <laughs> so that's what I would say. Try to get people from the industry, women specifically from the industry, to come and get involved as mentors so that they see people that are like them. And I think that would help encourage. So I don't, I don't know in terms of the evidence or, or uh, data behind it. So that's what I would say. God, you can't be afraid of me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. You'd be very afraid. No, I want to pick up on the, the, the lady from EPFL. And then I'm coming back for more yeah. questions. I have a, I have a oh, point for Okay, that, good, yeah. good. You go first. So I, I'm a master at debate now. That's one of the skills that I've definitely learned in being in my role. And often I'm the loudest woman in the room, often the loudest person in the room. Um, I challenge my male colleagues to get involved. So I don't care if it says, you know, I, I don't, uh, blue people <laughs> or whatever. Um, I'm like, I'll, I'll go anyway. I have been in several meetings that I wasn't invited to and where the person that organized the meeting just kind of looks at you and you're like, all right, but I don't particularly ask for permission. So that's what I would say to you to say to your male colleagues, <laughs> be like, all right, come along. Um, it says more about them if they don't want to, to be honest. Yes, but there's a lot of them and not so many of us. And I think that I have empathy, sympathy with your point because I take what you say, absolutely, and I'm not backwards in coming forwards, but I used to be, I used to be much shyer than I am now, but um, the, the point about being that sort of, the, the, the record that's stuck and constantly bringing up the issues, of, uh, if you're in the minority, and the, the really important thing, I think it's been said a couple of times, is to try and get the men to say it for you, you know, to make them part of the change. That's so important for us. So to me, networking like this is very important. And throughout my career, I have always networked or formed women's networks or been part of helping women's networks to grow. But don't just go. You need to build part of the other networks as well. Yeah. And, and you, need to, uh, to, you need to get men to take some of the lead in this area. It's really, really important that when you see uh, gender imbalance, that men are um, shouting about that as much as women. Otherwise, you are just that voice that they, it, they start to ignore because they hear it so often from... And there is also... I, the other thing I will add, because I can, because I'm the chair, is this: there is something about the way we speak that make it easy for men to ignore us. There's a, something about our physiology. You know the classic joke about how... Uh, a couple, a man and a woman sitting at breakfast and the man's reading the newspaper and the wife's talking the, the, the man just grunts and doesn't hear what she's saying. And I think this is just, it's a, there's a physiology thing. We talk at a, in a different sort of timbre. And the, um, if I had the screen, I'd show you a very good uh, comedy clip from the, the UK where um, there's a group of four men, there's a car, I'm going to go into this, there's a car that's locked and they don't know how to get the 
from the inside. They don't know how to get the, it's an old fashioned car to get the button up. And the woman comes along and says, what you need is to cut a tennis ball in half and create a vacuum, stick that uh, by sticking it on the car, and then the, the, you can drag the knob up and then, uh, then you can open the door. Uh, and there's a sports shop around the corner where they sell tennis balls. And the men stand there for a minute, and then one of the guys says, now what we need to do is get a tennis ball <laughs> and cut it in half, as if they hadn't heard the woman talk at all. And I'm convinced there is something in our physiology that makes us, but I haven't had the time to do the research on this, so I don't know for sure. But I do know that a lot of software products are not tested on women. Mm. In fact, there's a lot of things in this world, like drugs too, that are not tested on women enough. But Software products and devices are not tested on women because there just aren't any women, enough women in the groups in industry that are trying these things out. And very often something's released and a woman's never been anywhere near it. It's not just in our industry. This is why it's so important we get involved. I should shut up. Let's have, we've got time for another round of, from the audience. So there's a, there's a lady with her hand up there and this lady here, your second, and your last. This is the last one. Oh, Gertie, did you want to say something? Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I guess that you already answered part of my question. But we live in a, in a friendly environment inside of the universities or in the academia. But when we go out from the universities, the environment is a little bit more competitive and more aggressive. So which is your advice for these young women that they are finishing their careers and they, well, their PhDs or masters and they are starting an, in an aggressive environment, in a more competitive environment where we are a minority so it's not an easy deal. <laughs> and they will find a lot of guys that they are not friendly at all. So I used to work in an industry for almost 15 years and I was the boss for almost 50 guys and believe me it was not an easy deal so what could you like to advise them about okay, that? Okay hold that thought I think you'll get some interesting comments back now there's the the lady in the blue t-shirt down here yeah. I guess that means you're a volunteer is it? does that mean you're from here? <laughs> I haven't got the dress code yet Hey, my name is Anita and I'm originally from Uganda as a, an African girl coming from a developing country in the field of IT. Those are that many, as many barriers as you can put. <laughs> it's quite hard to get opportunities like this and, so, and it's quite hard for them to know about opportunities that are out there. So one of the things I'd like to ask is what kind of initiative in your organ various organizations do you have for African women in technology? And as well, I would, I'd, I'd, if this could be an additional comment or an observation, if we could, uh, part of the women in courage, if we could have like specific places for girls in technology coming in from Africa to encourage them to submit their work and present it here, I think it would help uh, for s encourage more girls from Africa to be in technology. Now and that's a thought for ACM Europe. We'll think about that one. Uh, on the end of that row there, and then we'll come to, to Gertie, because she's Gertie. <laughs> <laughs> and then back to the panel for a wrap up. Um, I have a question for those of you who are mothers. Um, are there moments when you look back and you wish you would have spent more time with your kids instead of uh, spending that time growing your career? Thank you. I don't know how many of the mothers. Okay, if, we, if um, Gertie might be able to, she's, she's a mother. Uh, yes. Say what you like, Gertie. Uh, the question would be, you know, I try to convince um, women, girls, since a couple of years to go into uh, technology and science. And what I have experienced is, to a certain extent, the women don't want to be put in front of the curtain, in the sense of they don't like to have uh, special female support activities because they say, oh, I'm like a man, I don't, why, why do I need this special support? 
And how can we convince, I, mean, I guess you all here don't need this because you have kind of, you have checked, yes, it's, a, it's, net, it's, in, it's important that I take the opportunity and that I network and so on. But there are much more, many more out there who say, I don't want to get this special treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, and my answer is always, you are not in need of support, you are worthy of support. But this is very difficult. This is one of the most difficult parts I mm -hmm. experience now also in the daily kind of work with the male and female students to really convince female that it's not because they have some disability, but just because yeah. for several hundreds of years they have been treated like they have been treated. <laughs> So, um, I'm going to ask you guys to address some of whatever of those you'd like to address, and, and this is this will be our wrap-up session. So, can I start? Pearl, you've already talked about. I'm going to start with Tony. Ooh, okay. Um, so, advice for dealing with a non-friendly environment. Um, I do not profess to have experienced what you've experienced, so I do not mean to tell you how to deal with it because I don't think I've had to deal with what you've done. I've been very lucky. Um, but the one thing I would say is, as much as I really, really want to change the world and I spend an awful lot of time talking to employers, telling them they need to get a handle on this, for you guys, uh, sadly, my best piece of advice is, if you can't change it from within, maybe it's time to leave. I am always reluctant to say that because I hate the idea of giving up. But sometimes, as Pearl was saying, you need to protect yourself, your health. And if it's wearing you down, as much as I want you to hold on and fight it out and make it better, you need to look after yourself too. So if it's really that bad, my advice is probably to move on and find a different, different employer. If employers realize that they're losing their talented women because the men are idiots and it's not being changed, management, because quite often it comes down, there's an ethos coming down and negative behavior and management probably need to step in and change it from the top. If that's really what's going on, maybe they need to see the women leaving and change will then happen. I feel very conflicted saying that though, incredibly, because I never want to advise no, a woman no. to give up. Yeah. Um, in terms of what we can do for African women, uh, if you're in HPC, set up a women in HPC chapter, wherever you are, I'm trying to, I'm sort of, copying ACMW here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't but, <laughs> but so HP when what, you, I'm coming back here to what I was asked at the beginning, why did I set up women in HPC? Because HPC really is this broad brush across not just the sciences anymore, but every subject, every traditional subject as I put it. And so it, it's different from computer science. And so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get a group of physicists in a u random university in a random country to set up their own little network. They all use HPC, but they've never met each other. So maybe that's something to take home. Maybe you go back and, and you look at, should you be starting something locally in your little group? Find out who else in your company or in your university is using whatever technology that makes you unique and build your own network from the ground up. You don't ask the question about kids? I don't have... No, nor do I. Oh, I, don't, I don't have kids. I would say, whatever you do, you'll look back and think that you wish you'd done something else, because I've done that with everything I've ever done. <laughs> so don't beat yourself up oh, about no, it. I don't, I don't. No, I no, don't think maybe, that. No. Maybe I need to be more mature. <laughs> no, I don't think that. Jane? Um, don't regret being a mother. Um, yes, of course you have moments where you think, I. I shouldn't be on this plane to some part of the world, I should be home with my child. But it's the same for men as well, because they, you know, they travel for, you know, it's, it's a fifth, if you have a 50-50 partnership, somebody's going to lose at some point because somebody's going to be working. So, no, I don't regret it, but I have to say my daughter has always said, whatever I do, I'm not going to do the kind of job you do, <laughs> because I don't want to go on planes all the time. Uh, and then ended up doing international real estate, so there you go. Whoa! <laughs> so, so she, she didn't take her own advice. Um, in terms of Africa, um, in Oracle, talking about Oracle, we have opened quite a few new offices uh, across Africa in uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, Nigeria. Um, you should look at a, a website called campus.oracle.com because that's where all the global internships and graduate jobs are posted. 
um, and that will include the, the African region. And um, two interns that we've actually got in Oracle Academy, one in Nigeria, one in Kenya, are both ladies, which I'm very pleased Fantastic. to say. Yeah. Uh, and they came through a competitive process. There was no bias, you know. So, you know, check that out. Um, and ooh, aggressive environment is a difficult one because, you know, I wouldn't want to say to everybody in this room, assume you're going into an aggressive environment because you may not be going into, but from what, you know, I, I actually like what Tony was saying is if you do feel you're in an environment where you're not valued as a woman, change it and also consider why don't you start your own business? Because we talk about careers, we talk about getting a job, but we never talk about the startup or, you know, becoming, you know, your own boss, you know. I started a business years and years ago and myself, unfortunately it was in the electronics industry, but subsequently collapsed in you. <laughs> around you, <laughs> yeah. Around me, but it was a very satisfying and scary experience, you know, and it actually took me into a male industry, but I actually ran my own business. So think about that, you know, think about changing your perception about my career isn't necessarily somebody else's destiny for me, it's your own destiny. I think also you're, you see academia through rose-coloured spectacles. Academia can be the worst, competitive, oh, yeah. difficult really, environment. Yeah. You can have a horrible time in academia. It just depends on the people, the place, the circumstance. So, um, okay, Pearl, your, your last thoughts on, on those um, issues. Okay, so for, for Africa, I think in Switzerland there's a scholarship program for, for uh, uh, students from Africa. So look it up and you can contact me. Uh, for your question, uh, it's a question I ask every day uh, when the kids was, uh, were little. Uh, and they grow up really fast. Mm. Uh, so my advice is that just think about life is long. So if you really want to spend with the kids, you, you should take time off and spend time with them. Uh, but also keeping your profession is the best way to, uh, to establish a very long relationship with your children. Uh, among, among the friends that I know, I think my children really um, uh, respect my advice because I know what's going on in the field. I can tell them uh, what to do and so on. And they, they have confidence in me. Um, otherwise, uh, again, it's, um, it's a personal choice, um, but um, there are a lot of um, nice books out there too. There's one book I read, it's called Ask the Children, oh. and that settles it for me, because they prefer a mom who uh, is pursuing a meaningful career, so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Becky, what would your final comments be? Um, you know, it's funny, I, I think about this question too. So I've been with Bloomberg for 10 years, like I've said like a million times now. <laughs> and I've actually decided to put off having kids. Um, I'm actually not even married at this point. Not that that's ever yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's an indication. Traditional values <laughs> coming in. Um, but then I think about like my dad and my role models. My dad had a serious job in the United States Navy. And I think back on it, and I, I feel like he was so involved in my life. And when I hear about the massive accomplishments in his career now that he's passed, I can't believe he didn't talk to me about them because of all of the amazing things that he did. And I really, what I really remember is him being there when he was there. So like when he was around me, he was really there. And that's what I remember. So I'm not a mom, but that's my, <laughs> that's my perspective on it. <laughs> Silly, I know. No, it's not. No, that's very profound. Um, in terms of Africa, I love Africa. It's like one of my favorite places to visit. I'm, uh, um, I'm not sure what recruitment programs that we specifically target for Africa, but I do know that I have several African colleagues that I esteem very highly. So similarly to, the, I'll throw a web link at you, Bloomberg Careers. Um, I know that we have several opportunities and so that but it's a really good question I think that we should think more about it so <coughs> thank you for asking it because I wouldn't have just you know <laughs> come to it myself um, your question actually statement I guess statement question is something that that I struggle with because I actually feel like I'm in the group of women that wonders why we have so many things for women um, so I struggle with this a lot and what I've decided to do because I I am one of few um, very strong women in Bloomberg Engineering. 
and like I said, I'm often the loudest person in the room, and I get asked a lot, and so what I've decided to do is just start speaking. Like, I'm here now, obviously, um, and I've been speaking. I actually did a very uncomfortable talk at, at in Bloomberg Engineering um, for women. I actually, I actually restricted it to women, which now I'm kind of going back and I'm thinking that was kind of dumb based on what I said in the last you know, in the last question set, um, because I was nervous and it was the first time that I had really talked about like my successes and my failures to a group of people and opened up really. So that's what I've started to do, um, is just talk about my experiences. Because I find that easier for me than answering the question, you know, why aren't you involved in a women's um, group? Why aren't you doing these things? So I, I talk about my own experiences. So I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> But that's my perspective. Um, and then in the last question, in terms of difficult environment, um, I think the number one thing that you have to do, and, and for everybody, not just um, the lady that asked the question, but you, you really have to believe in yourself. You are special. There is something that you do that no one else does, or the combination of things that you do that no one else does. So number one, just believe in yourself. And there are gonna be people that you don't wanna work with. If you, I've, I've sat down in interviews and been like, and I, and I did the interview, and I did it well, and they offered me the job, and I was like, you know what, no thanks. Um, so that's gonna happen, because you're interviewing them as well, and I completely agree, you shouldn't be in a place that you don't want. And also, sort of keep in the back of your mind that the person you're interviewing with, you might not actually have to work with. So there's that as well. Like if you really love the company, and you're like, man, this interview is so hard, and I don't like this person at all, you may not actually have to work with them, so. <laughs> That's my advice. Persevere, I guess, in a very short sentence. Thank you. Well, I hope you've all got something out of that. I, um, I, um, I, all through my career, which is far too long now, um, I have had to find a balance between doing this sort of networking and being a computer scientist. And I don't want to be known, uh, sorry, I want to be known as a top computer scientist. Mm -hmm. I do not want to be known as a top female computer scientist yeah. and the trouble is with this if you do too much of this stuff and there's a lot I win awards all the time and I get an award for being a woman and I think hey you know I, don't, I want to win the awards the men are winning as well uh, well not as well I want to win those and recently I won something in the UK which is open to men and women and I was described in the press release as a top female computer scientist. And I think that puts me in a box of a very small number of people. Maybe I'm, you know, but it sort of put, makes me feel a bit second rate. And that's not what we're trying to do here. We can be the best. And I think it's very, very important that we don't put women into a box marked women mm -hmm. and say tick on the box. And, and Jane, I'm sure Oracle isn't like this, but some companies do do this, and some universities do this, and I've seen it with, uh, uh, shut up, I, I'm the chair, I'm not supposed to be saying too much, but I think this is really important. And your point about Africa, I throw that to the ACM Women Europe exec to think about whether we want to open scholarships up from people uh, from uh, countries like Africa uh, for future women in courage. Um, I want to finish by thanking everyone. I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank the people who organized today. We have, this is not the closing session, this is just me. Is Gabby here? Gabrielle, I saw you come in. No, she's not. If, can anyone see her? She's lurking around. Um, I, I want to thank the uh, ACM Women Europe team who organized this, Rayanne and everybody. I'm going to miss people out if I list everybody, but particularly Gabrielle, who's not here. Uh, all the people who've made this conference work, thank you so much. And, and now we hand over to the closing team, which is our president. Vicky Hansen, you're coming down to say something, aren't you? I have no idea. Who's in charge of the closing? Come down. And Nuria's coming down to talk about next year. I'm happy to be in charge. Come on. <laughs>